Hello everyone, I am Charlotte McFarlane from The Writable and this is season two of the Story Coaching Podcast. I am so excited to be here for our second season. We have lots of really exciting, interesting topics and some guests planned for this season um, where we are going to talk about, I mean really what, what you guys identified for me as some of the things you really wanted to know the most about uh, when it comes to writing. You know, this podcast really is is here to support new writers, people who are writing either their first book or looking to write their best book. Um, and, And I'm just, I'm just so happy to be able to share some of my experience, to share the experience of some of my, some of my writing friends and colleagues, and help you guys share your story. You know, after all, I believe that everything is writable. I believe that everyone has a story to tell, everyone has something to share with the world, and all of it, any idea can be written into uh, an excellent, engaging book. So today, uh, I really wanted to kind of rapid fire go through some of my top tips for writing, and, and really we're looking at a lot of new writer mistakes um, and how to avoid them, really. Just just things that I see frequently in manuscripts or that I see uh, new writers sort of making in their approach, in their mindset. You know, we talk here a lot about mindset. We talk here a lot about what it takes, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally to to write a book and to launch an author career. Um, so yeah, so today is really just all about some of my, you know, again, my, my top tips, um, based on things that I have seen, uh, over the years, either, either editing or coaching or, um, just, just hanging out, you know, with different writers on the writer forums, that sort of thing. So without further ado, let's get going. So writer mistake number one, um, I just say we're using flowery language or um, over editing and and really the the idea the thing that goes wrong with some new authors is they start putting the sentence structure they start putting um, they, they start trying to make these really pretty sentences over uh, over you know they put the importance on the sentence over the story and and you know Unfortunately, when we're talking about storytelling, the core of that is story. And, and that's what humans are attracted to. You know, humans have evolved because of our ability to tell stories and because of our love of sharing stories. So when the story isn't there, it doesn't matter how good the writing is. It doesn't matter how, how beautiful the sentences are. And for sure, it doesn't mean that that we should ignore sentence structure. It doesn't mean that we should ignore, you know, the beauty of of prose and of writing. You know, we can think of, you know, some you know some of my favorite authors. Um, you know, I think primarily of of Margaret Atwood, who uh, if if you haven't heard of her, I mean, very prominent Canadian author. She wrote um, The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, she has this incredible way with words, um, where they're just the words she uses just captivate you and they just they just grab you around the heart and and pull you through a story um and and she just she just does this beautiful she does this beautiful prose um but the story underneath is always really really sound and that's something that um that I do find some writers are missing and and the the solution really is to always remember story before prose and we we can think of we can probably think of some recent examples of um very popular books uh that you know the the prose the writing the sentence structure even the grammar was not so hot uh but the story underneath was captivating it hit all the right notes for the readers whether you, whether you liked the story or didn't it it hit the right notes for a lot of readers and it allowed those books which may have been <laughs> questionably written um to to hit the bestseller lists and that's something that we can all learn from and remember that the story 
is far more important than the sentences, than the prose that are telling it. Not that you shouldn't aim to have good sentences, but remember what's important when you're going through your story. All right, mistake number two, too much backstory or boring introductions. And, um, and this is something I've done. I mean, all of these mistakes is something I've done for sure. Um, but, you know, really we're talking here, you know, we, we know as writers that we're supposed to have backstory. We're supposed to have, you know, we're, we're supposed to know where the characters have been. We're supposed to know how the world has developed um, all of the, all of the little intricate pieces and how they connect. We're supposed to know that. And what happens, I think, um, and, and what I have done is we, we're so eager to just get writing. We think that writing a story is actually about typing words onto the page. Um, we're so eager to just get going that instead of taking the time to plan all that stuff out before we start writing the story, we're trying to write it as we write the story. And we end up with you know, a chapter or two or six that is just filled with backstory. And that unfortunately becomes very boring. So the solution really is to, is to try to get all of that planning work out of the way before you start writing. You want to get to a point where you know your characters, you know your world really well, you know, maybe not totally inside out, but, but you know, 80 to 90 percent of of who they are you know you you could have a conversation with them the same as you could have a conversation with someone you met on the street um and so you want to be planning that you want to have that that familiarity with all of the pieces of your story before you start writing and then when you actually start writing you want to start in the present conflict and and usually you know we did have our episode on hooks um, and really what you're aiming for is to, um, is to really hit some sort of everyday conflict. You don't want to get right into the story conflict at the beginning, but e- an everyday conflict that the character is facing. You want to start right there at an everyday conflict in the present moment, in the now, and just keep going forward. And then you drop in the little pieces of backstory as as they become important to the story or or if there's a good if there's a good spot where there's something relevant happening. Um, and the last thing you want to really do is is spend, you know, a prologue <laughs> trying to explain everything in the story. Um, try you know, or a couple of chapters trying to explain everything. You even don't want to be trying to lace in explanation in through all of the action in your first chapter because it it just unfortunately makes it boring and it it makes readers it just turns readers off you know and that's not something that you want so so plan first get to know all of the pieces so that when you start writing and you're writing in the now you're writing in the moment you know everything that you need to know and that usually allows you to know how to share it and how to show it rather than to just tell someone all the facts. Now, writer mistake number three that I sometimes see is the exact opposite. It's not enough backstory. It's having superficial characters or worlds or plots where things don't, you know, where, where we're kind of just dealing with cardboard cutouts. And that's, that's not something, we know that. That's not something that we want. The solution, of course, is is planning before writing, again, um, and and you can uh, I'll drop the link for my story planning guide into the description, uh, so that you can use that. And that really is I mean it's a comprehensive planning guide. It's got a lot of the questions that I'm asking myself, and the step by step of how I'm generating uh, all of the different pieces, and and then starting to work them into a plot for my stories before I start writing. And really what we're concerned about here and what we want to avoid is we want to avoid characters that have shifting motivations or that have shifting values. We want to avoid situations where, you know, the rules of the world apply in one situation but don't apply in another situation. We want to avoid really um, facts of convenience. We want to avoid a character who believes one thing in one scene but when it's convenient for them to believe or or to be trying to work towards something else in another scene, then that's what they believe. 
We're trying to avoid that plot-driven fiction where the character just kind of fits in as the writer needs them to in order to drive the plot. Uh, the other thing that we want to avoid is we want to avoid those shifting rules in world building. Something where, you know, hey, this, you know, you know, we want to avoid having a character get stuck and then we just make up an arbitrary rule like, oh, well, usually you can't do this, but it's, you know, it's the fifth Tuesday of the month, so now we can. Um, I don't even know if you can get five Tuesdays in a month. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, so that's really, you know, both of those really just come down to, to planning, just to knowing some, some facts about your story elements before you start writing. Simple enough to do, but I know a lot of new writers that, that don't take the time to do it. Right. Writer mistake number four. You've probably heard this one before, but I think a big mistake that new writers make is not hiring professionals. Um, and, and that's, you know, we talk primarily about storytelling here. So not hiring a professional editor um, is, is really, really the biggest impediment to having a good story, in my opinion. Um, certainly some people, you know, have, have a natural gift. Certainly, you know, I try to, I, I do teach people through the right now program, how to construct your story and how to go back and edit it and make sure that it is all, all, um, you know, coherent and, and, and works together. Um, but at the end of the day, I still recommend having another set of eyes on it. Um, having someone else read this, uh, read your story and make sure that it is something um, enjoyable to read because because when we're writers we get really close to the story we we fall in love with things you've probably heard the phrase you know kill your darlings um, and and that really just means there are things that when we write we think they're so amazing we think they're so cool we think they're just the most incredible thing that's ever happened um, and we get kind of blind to the fact that maybe those those you know really scenes that we love don't actually fit the story don't push the story forward and so another set of eyes and when I say a professional you know professional someone who has studied story someone who understands story and can look at it objectively you know is really going to be a lot better than your mom or, or your you know or your boyfriend reading it um you know now now I say that you know my first reader is usually my husband my proofreader is my mom I've come to that um I've I've come to that through kind of years of trial and error and hiring professionals and knowing that my anal retentive mother is the very best person at, at catching typos so don't don't necessarily do what I do you want a professional who can turn around and give you useful feedback is really what I'm getting at here. You don't want someone who's going to say, um, Hey, yeah, it was good. I liked it. You know, which, which is what, which is what friends say. Um, whether they liked it or not, if you've got, <laughs> if you've got, you know, decent friends, um, you want, and, and you don't want someone who's just going to say, I didn't like it. It kind of sucked. Uh, without being able to tell you why, without being able to tell you places that um, that that could be improved or different ways that you could probably fix things or improve things, instead of just I didn't like this, because um, that can be really frustrating. You know, one of the most frustrating things that I went through with my first book was, um, it, and I had hired professional editors uh, from. Um, from like respectable publishing houses that did, you know, sort of freelance work on the side, I paid a lot of money <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, was told book is really good, except this one character just doesn't work and not being able to, um, share why, <laughs> why, and, and what it was that I could do. Um, and so of course, I mean, that, that was a professional and she had some ideas, but she, you know, there was, there was not a, a really clear way. And that was really frustrating for me. Um, whereas, you know, if, if you've got a friend that's just reading this for you, um, or, or even just, you know, 
someone who someone who says, yeah, I can edit it for you, but maybe doesn't really know what they're doing, hasn't really studied story, um, they can tell you what works and what doesn't, but they may or may not be able to tell you how to fix it, how to make it better. And so, of course, the solution to this is really just hiring professionals. <laughs> and, and I know 100% that professionals are expensive. Um, I, I know that, and I know that a lot of new writers maybe don't have the budget for a professional edit. So there are ways to get around it. Um, you can, uh, you know, I'm always going to recommend using, (laughs) using an editor. Um, but you can also use beta readers and you can find beta readers on Fiverr. You can find beta readers on Facebook, like there are Facebook groups. You can, um, you can trade manuscript reviews with another author usually for free, um, hopefully for free if you're, if you're also reviewing their book. Now what's tricky is that these people, again, may or may not be able to tell you why something works or what they, sometimes, you know, they just say like, I just didn't like this part, but no idea really why. Um, so, so there's a little bit of a, a grain of salt in there of, you know, knowing, knowing that whoever is reading your work may or may not be the be all end all, I guess. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to have someone hopefully knowledgeable about fiction, look at your fiction and help you because, because that really makes all of the, makes all of the difference, you know, and, and the editor that I hired for my first book, I mean, she had so many great suggestions and so I, I learned so much just from just from that one edit you know I I you know became so much better at writing just through that one edit because of the feedback that she'd given me as a professional so within you know within what you can do hiring a professional really has a lot of a lot of benefits for you and and I do strongly strongly recommend it and your first book is when you want to be doing it. It's it's not something that you want to be doing at your 10th book. It's it's the first book where it makes the most difference. All right, writer mistake number 5, waiting to be quote ready. Um and I I get this. You know, I remember my first book um you know, the the first set of books that I I published was a story that I absolutely loved. Absolutely just adored and I thought it was going to be the greatest book ever written. I thought it was going to be, you know, my ticket to fame and fortune. I thought people all over the world were going to read it and they were going to just love it and their lives were going to be changed and it was going to be groundbreaking, earth-shattering fiction. And I remember thinking, you know, when I first thought of the idea, like, oh, I better... I better wait. I'm not ready to write this. I'm not someone who knows enough at this point, who's skilled enough at this point to actually write the story to the level that it needs to be written. And I think that that's a mistake. Um, and I, and I did just jump into and, and write that book. And, and I think that that was again, one of the best things that I could have done, um, next to hiring a professional editor. Um, and that's, that's because, you know, I really just jumped in. I, I loved this story. I believed in it so much. Um, and it, and it is a great story. Um, I I believed in it so much that, you know, I, I wrote it and then needed like a year and a half to edit it. And, and really what I was doing in that period was I was learning. I was getting better. I was becoming the person capable of telling that story. I wasn't ready when I started. I became the person who was ready by the time I finished. And I think that that's really the secret in general of of doing anything, but really with writing, you want to start now and just learn as you go. There's I I really believe that that's the best way to do it and and be aware that it's going to be a learning process, but you want to start now and you want to start with something that you're excited about so that you have the, um, you have the love and you have the passion that's going to carry you through the whole project. I don't think I would have learned as much had I started with a story that I 
didn't really care about and just was writing it to gain experience. So don't wait to be ready to to start writing. Don't wait to be ready to tell the story that you really want to tell. You will become the person ready to do that through the act of doing it. And writer mistake number six, not taking writing seriously. So this is, this is kind of the second half of the last one. You know, um, when I was a kid, I, I loved to write, but I would write whenever the mood struck, which meant maybe every couple months. And I mean, that's fine when you're, when you're just sort of doing it, whatever, no big deal. But um, you probably, if you're listening to this podcast, you are interested in writing stories. You're interested in finishing a book. You're interested in having it published. You're interested in maybe making this a career for you. And something that I think can be a little bit backwards thinking is we think, I'm going to wait before to be a professional before I take my writing seriously. And we've talked about this at length um, back at the beginning of season one, I know. So, so we won't uh, go crazy here, but I think it's really important to set goals with your writing, even if you're just starting out. If this is something you want to be serious about, you need to start by being serious. And, and goals, you know, for some people, a daily, a daily goal makes sense, um, a word count goal makes sense, or just a time goal makes sense. For me right now, I'm actually, um, you may know I recently had a baby, so my goals are set weekly. And and monthly, you know, it's like, I want to get this much done this week, but I know that every day is not predictable. (laughs) No day is predictable. Um, and, and I'm just going to write whenever I have a moment to do it, but hopefully at the, but at the end of the week, I want to have gotten this much done. And so that pushes me to, to work for it and to try to, to try to get those, try to get those words in, um, and, and just take it seriously even knowing that, you know, maybe it's not a daily thing, um, but having having some type of goal and whatever's going to work for you, maybe it is just to write four days out of the week, but set a goal, work towards it, and and that's really the best thing that you can do to take your writing seriously and to start advancing your, your skills and your ability and, and work towards that writing career. All right, and now I want to get a little bit into um, some of the stuff that I see in manuscripts again. So the big one is telling and not showing. And this is something um, that I talk about in the Pick Up the Pen Challenge. Uh, You can now access that on demand. uh, So you can access that whenever you want um, and and see some of those lessons about. um, And I think uh, the fourth day is about telling and not showing. and, and the biggest thing that I can tell you quickly is you want to make your writing immediate, which means not filtering it through the experience of a character. You don't want to say, Shelley saw a bird. You just want to say, there is a bird. So that the reader is experiencing it immediately as if they were there. And that is how you show someone something as opposed to telling them. You also want to make it emotional. So instead of just saying, there is a bird, you might say something like, the most wondrous bird in the world flew by in front of a rain. I don't know, that's totally made up. But um, uh, you want to add a layer of emotion to it. Um, that is going to add to the showing and not the telling. And, and emotion is added through our choice of words more um, and through the actions more than it's shared through saying, you know, the bird was wondrous. <laughs> you, you say, you know, you say um, a golden bird and that that can, depending on, you know, depending on the genre, instigate certain feelings in the reader and that's really what you want to be aiming for writer mistake number eight that I see and oh gosh I see this a lot so please don't do it anymore (laughs) Um, and it's poor use of dialogue and it's really using dialogue to try to tell us things Um, you know you uh, the classic is is seeing um you know, someone walks up to someone and says, so you know, 
and then shares a, or, or or as as you already know and then shares a bunch of world building facts or character facts or story facts and you're trying to use dialogue to um to pass information along to the reader because we know that we should show it and not tell it but that really just clunks up your dialogue so much that it I mean it really makes no difference whether you do that type of thing in the dialogue or in the narrative so um so really just paying attention to the dialogue and what you want to be aiming for is realistic dialogue um People in general, when they're having conversations, say no more than one or two sentences in a row. Uh, they don't often go off on big monologues unless you're like me and you're recording a podcast where it's just you talking. Um, but but most people in conversation will only say one or two sentences, and that's how you want to keep your dialogue pretty pretty short um, and having a lot of exchange. And then the other thing with dialogue is that its primary purpose is to enhance um, primarily character. Dialogue is used for character building. Um, And that doesn't mean sharing like, oh, Jenny has yellow hair. That means sharing what a person says, says a lot about them, what they say, how they say it. And that's how you want to use your dialogue. Um, You're also building in elements of conflict. Um, Dialogue is a great way to introduce interpersonal conflict um, and to and to further elements of plot. So if someone learns something new in the dialogue, that's a great use of dialogue. As long as it's not so, you know, or as you know, Um, so so using dialogue more effectively and using it for what it's meant for. And using it in a realistic way is really what you want to be aiming for. And the best way to do it really is is to say it out loud, get a friend to read it with you, get some sock puppets, whatever you need to, to know whether it sounds realistic or not. Um, and then just asking yourself, what is the point of this sentence? What is the point of this person sharing this? Can I help you so much to, to enhance your dialogue? Alrighty, writer mistake number nine, plot holes and um, and hand wavy them. I I heard this for the first time the other day on um, oh, Brandon Sanderson's podcast, hand wavy them, and um, uh, it's this idea of basically sort of conveniently covering up plot holes, um, suddenly allowing you know allowing those rules to be bent. And it just, it just is really frustrating to the reader because when you're a reader and you're going through uh, a story, you are actively paying attention to the facts, to the rules that are shared with you. And you're like, you're installing them in your brain and and you're learning these rules. And so when, um, when you have a plot hole, when you have something happen conveniently, when you have, uh, you know, hand wavium is kind of this idea of saying, um, what did we say before? Like, uh, normally this wouldn't work, but because it's the fifth Tuesday of the month, it's fine. Um, that's, you know, that's hand wavium. And, and if you're a reader and all of a sudden an author does that, it discounts all of the work that you have done as the reader in learning these rules. Um, and, and just, you know, just, it doesn't feel very nice. It just feels convenient. So the best solution I have for you is, is to plan ahead. Um, next week, I'm going to go through my story planning and plotting process um, that really, and, and I, what I do is I break down my plot sort of very much like very in detail, step by step so that I can watch it like a movie and make sure everything fits together before I even start writing. So so the best solution is to plan ahead so that you don't run into plot holes so that you can fix them before you've, before you've gotten there. If you've already got a manuscript and you're finding you've got some of these areas, or if you're halfway through and you need to add something in, just be aware that, that you can absolutely, but you need to go back and add foreshadowing in so that 
you know, if, if you want to have a rule where this does work because it's the fifth Tuesday of the month, you might want to add in in the beginning an example where um, where there was another situation where that exception to the rule actually worked. Exceptions to rules aren't really great ideas, but sometimes you you just <laughs> you just use them. Um, so adding foreshadowing in earlier on can make sort of that hand wavy just magically covering up a plot hole can make it seem like, oh yeah, the most brilliant thing that's, uh, you know, the most brilliant sort of like workaround loophole that's ever been, ever been done. So either of those, either planning ahead or if you find yourself halfway through, making some notes for yourself to go back so that you can foreshadow that accurately or, or adequately um, can really make a big difference in the final product. And number 10 um, is repetitive description. So when I write my first drafts, I am really bad for people using eye movements to share their emotions. So, you know, people do a lot of glancing, they do a lot of glaring, they do a lot of whatever. And, um, and when I go back through and I edit, I have to take all of that stuff out. So you can get a leg up on not making the same mistakes that I do. Really the solution here is to be adding more details. And I'm not one for um, really excessive detail, but what you want to do really is create in your own mind a much broader image of what the scene looks like. So for example, you know, I'm using a lot of eye movements usually to, uh, to demonstrate, you know, tension or uncertainty in characters, you know, they're glancing at someone because they don't, they don't, you know, know what that person is thinking or, you know, they're, they're glaring over here because they're trying to figure out what someone is thinking. Um, but tension, you know, shows up in our bodies in lots of different ways. You know, so it might be, um, you know, the shoulders rising up. It might be, you know, the hands you know, clenching. Um, lots of different body movements share the same emotion. We can also add detail in the setting itself because the way that we the way that we set the setting paints a certain picture and the way that a character interprets and talks about the setting really creates a much different, uh, it really creates a very, um, a very strong mood or helps share their mood uh, in a very showing friendly way. For example, you know, so, so maybe I've got a character who's tense the setting around them, how is the setting tense? And, and maybe the, the setting itself is actually tense. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, you know, kind of a, a seedy bar where they're not sure what's going to happen. So there's, you know, the lighting is dim. The, um, you know, the patrons are sort of like big and kind of, you know, they look like ruffians. They're kind of scary. Maybe, you know, people are watching them as much as they're watching other people. Um, or maybe it's a fairly benign setting, but the way that the character is describing the setting is, um, is showcasing their tension. For example, you know, and, and I'm sure we've all, we've all experienced this, you know, if, if you're in a good mood, something seems one way, but if you're in a bad mood, the same exact thing might seem a completely different way. Or, you know, two people will have different experiences depending on their previous experiences and their state of mind when they have the experience. So, you know, maybe, you know, maybe again, it's, it's a fairly benign setting, but the character is describing things in a very tense way um, to, you know, the sun in the sky, the clouds, you know, maybe the clouds are making kind of scary shapes or she's picking out scary shapes from the clouds Maybe the way that the grass is sort of like blowing in the breeze or, or shifting in the breeze seems very sharp and sudden, as opposed to if she was happier, it would be just kind of like waving and flowy. So, um, so there are lots of ways that we can showcase the emotion in a scene by using different descriptions. And 
Um, and what we can also do is create a bank, you know, so, so when I go through and I sort of visualize what a scene is going to look like in my head, picking out a lot of those extra details, um, going a little bit deeper, writing them all down so that I have them handy, and then writing my scene so that I have the, the descriptions to, um, to fall back on. All right, so those are the 10 kind of big writer mistakes. And really what I wanted to share more than anything was my advice on how to improve them. So if you are making some of those mistakes, if you look at your manuscript and you're like, yeah, no, I'm doing all 10 of those, that's okay. You know, remember, we are always learning. Um, I wanted to, and, and that really is kind of the underlying, one of the underlying themes of this podcast. It's something I want to share with you all the time. Um, we're always learning and, and I want to leave you um, at the end of this episode with a quote from Maya Angelou. And you've pro- you may or may not have heard it before, but it's something that sticks with me all the time. And it's do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And uh, I listen to a lot of like Oprah Super Soul Sunday and and she always says, when you know better, you do better. And that's, that's just it. That's the point for this episode. Let me share with you some of these things that I see. Let me share with you ways that you can move through them. Now you know, now you can recognize them in your manuscript and now you can do better. All right, so that is it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. I am so excited to get going on season two. So I will see you next week. Next week, we are going to talk about, um, as I think I mentioned earlier, um, we're going to talk about basically my my system. I'm going to tell you in depth how it is that I generate, you know, how, how I do my story planning, how I do my plotting, how I get to the point where I'm able to sit down and just write. So I will see you for that episode next week. Again, thank you for joining me, guys, and uh, happy writing.